What does the Bible say about dreams? Well, that's a great question, and to uh, discuss with me the subject of dreams today, author, lecturer, Ken Johnson. Ken, glad you're here with me, and uh, let's talk about dreams. Let's do that. Uh, Ken has written uh, a book, uh, among his many books, uh, called The Ancient Language of Dreams, and it's all about dreams from the biblical perspective. And it's a subject uh, that I think a lot of people uh, encounter in their lives. Of course, we all dream. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a question, well, what constitutes a dream in the biblical sense? Or uh, what's a vision? And so let's talk about dreams and visions uh, in the Bible. Uh, in fact, let's talk about your book. Uh, what what uh, convinced you that you should sit down and do a manuscript on dreams and visions? Well, throughout the years going to church, I'd run across people that would tell me, I believe the Lord want me to tell you this, or you uh -huh. should be doing this, or I had a dream about this. And it seems like almost always it, it amounts to nothing. So those were false dreams or false prophets. But throughout the scriptures you see false prophets, of course, but then true prophets. Sometimes people have visions, mm -hmm. they have angelic visitations, or they have dreams. Uh, in Daniel, a dream is called a night vision. So if it's something from the Lord. So I wanted to sit down and go through a list of examples. There's a lot of examples in Scripture, but pull out specific ones to get us thinking about if I had a dream, how would I interpret that? Well, I want to read the, the Scripture that I think everybody will recognize. Peter on Pentecost, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17, It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out uh, of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And of course he's quoting prophet Joel, mm -hmm. and he is standing up making an announcement about the general uh, dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And it, it's very interesting that he includes this idea of dreams and visions here. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's revisit dreams and visions as, as we find them in the Bible. Uh, going all the way back to the beginning, and, and in your book, and I'm just going to open to the table of contents, <clears throat> you have an incident in the life of Abraham and King uh, Abimelech. And let's just talk about that one for a minute and set the stage for uh, dreams and visions. Yeah, at this, ta at this case uh, there was a famine. Abraham went down uh, out of the land to seek food. Uh, he took his wife Sarah with him. And it was the common uh, custom of that realm, if you find a cute girl the king may want her, you take her, as long as she's not married to someone else. And Abraham had heard there was also a custom that if she was married, she was really beautiful and the king still wanted her, you could just kill the husband. So he was scared for his life. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, yeah, this is Sarah, my sister. And they went ahead and took her uh, to be part of Abimelech's uh, harem. But that night the Lord appeared in a dream to Abimelech saying, this woman belongs to another man. She's another man's wife. If you touch her, you and your household will die. And it's kind of interesting, the Lord is in control of things and He made sure that nothing would happen with Sarah. But it's also interesting that Abimelech may not have been a believer as far as a, a devout Jew or Christian. Mm -hmm. So the Lord can speak into dreams uh, to just about anybody. And Abimelech, of course, went to Abraham and said, is this true? Is she really your wife? And he said, well, yes. And he said, you almost had me to commit a major sin. Take her and get out. And so the Lord intervened in that situation all through a dream. And uh, of course we're, we're talking uh, about a patriarch here. We're talking mm -hmm. about a man of immense importance, Abraham, Father Abraham, uh, father of the household of faith. Mm -hmm. Huge historical figure. And the question that pops into my mind and, and perhaps into yours, well that this would happen in the life of a very, very important man like, uh, like Abraham. Uh, but would it happen in my life? I'm not that important. Well you don't know that you are. 
You don't know that you talking to someone tomorrow may spark something that causes multiple people to get saved. Uh, you just don't know. You don't know the future. Abraham probably didn't know a whole lot of the future That's at true. that time, true. So if you're not really important, then yeah, maybe it is not going to happen to you. It may not be very important, but you just never know. We always need to seek to try to be uh, as delic delicately witnessing to people as we can. Now, we're kind of setting the stage here for a discussion about uh, the way God speaks to the faithful. And uh, I know that many of you who are watching this right now have had questions in your own mind. Uh, would God ever speak to me this way? Or uh, maybe you're saying, you know, I had a dream a month ago and I really wondered uh, about it. Did that come from God or not? And so let's continue our march through history and uh, let's go to Jacob next and, and talk about Jacob's uh, uh, dream at Bethel. Yeah, at that point, Jacob had, and this is a good example too, none of these people were perfect. They all wanted to serve God, but they sinned in different ways. Uh -huh. uh, lying about who's your wife, for instance. Jacob's case, um, he comes to, comes to Bethel, he lays down, he has a dream of angels ascending and descending. And the Lord basically talks to him saying that uh, I had planned for you to, uh, to inherit the, the, the kingdom and out of you to make a great nation, just like I promised Abraham and Isaac, and now you, you're the descendant of this. And we would have done it very nicely, peacefully. You took it upon yourself to make sure it happened. You deceived people. Mm -hmm. Because of that, you will be deceived, and you will pay the penalty for it. But I'm with you, I will bless you, and my work will still come to pass. So that's a good example of us following God's will, but not trying to step into the middle of it and kind of mess things up. If the Lord wants you to be president, for instance, you will be. And if the Lord doesn't want you to be, you won't. Hmm. So you need to follow directions, but not decide, well, if I just lie a little bit, I'll, it'll work. No, God will take care of that for you. The old fudge factor. Yeah. And I'm thinking back to Abraham and Abimelech, and, and what must have gone through Abraham's mind? He's entering the domain of a powerful king, and going through all the possible options and he says, you know, I, wow, what should I do? I think I'd better misrepresent this whole thing. Mm -hmm. and, and God took care of that because God had a plan. Mm -hmm. And he took care of it through a dream. It's really amazing. You stop and think about it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, who would you like to talk about next? Jacob uh, had an interaction with Laban uh, that involved a dream. And I think everybody has heard about that one. Yeah, that, that was interesting too because Jacob uh, again was a believer. Uh, Jacob's following what the Lord's told him to do. Laban is, most people think, an unbeliever. At the very least he knows about God but doesn't care to follow God. He's mm -hmm. greedy, he wants his own way. And he, he has a dream where God says, don't touch Jacob, don't try to help him, don't try to hurt him. Leave him alone, he's mine. You know, and so Laban is, is thinking, okay, I better not. So you might think, well, if I help him and make him rich and then take part of it, I'll get rich. Or if I cheat him, you know. And God says, don't touch him. Don't think about him. Leave him alone. That's a warning. And so Jacob uh, or Laban did that. So really good examples. Yeah, and now, where should we go from here? Uh, uh, just to kind of build a discussion, a uh, basis for discussion about dreams. We haven't talked about uh, the difference at this point between dreams and visions. Uh, a dream, we all have dreams. Uh, sometimes they're what we call crazy dreams, mm -hmm. meaningless dreams. I think we all have uh, dreams that just, wow, I dreamed about such and such last night and it made no sense whatsoever. Uh, it, right. In fact, it was just cra every did, everybody in the dream did crazy things. Mm -hmm. and I think we all have dreams like that. Uh, Visions? I don't know that I've ever had a vision. Now, how do you distinguish between dreams and visions? Well, I think it's, it's important to look at three different parts to this. We could have an angelic visitation, which means an angel could appear, sit down and talk with us. Mm -hmm. That'd be just like you got a phone call from somebody. It's nothing miraculous on your part, it's just something that happened. The angel that told you something, it could be either right or wrong, depending if it's a lying angel or an angel from God. So that's a visitation. 
uh, a dream, of course, we know that about going to sleep at night and seeing something. As a matter of fact, in the book of Daniel, it talks about dreams as being night visions. So a vision is when you see something. So if an angel were to, to appear to you and just talk to you, that would be a conversation. If he would somehow show you everything that's happening in a certain situation, that would be a vision. Mm-hmm. And of course, if that happened while you were at night asleep, that would be a dream. And it's kind of important to understand if, if something supernatural happened, it's not you. Uh, but if you're having a dream, it could be the pizza you ate last night. So if it gets really weird, then you've got to try to figure it out. The, the church fathers made it kind of easy to understand. They said that false prophets, false dreams, normal dreams are kind of garbled with a bunch of different things. Sometimes they're so dark that they don't really have a meaning at all. Mm-hmm. And their teaching is that if you know the scriptures, specifically the New Testament, and you have a dream, it'll make sense. So you know the scriptures, I know the scriptures. Mm-hmm. If we get together and talk about a dream I had, a dream you had, we'd say that doesn't fit anything, it doesn't make sense. Or we would say, hey, I know exactly what that means. A, a, a test then, a kind of a litmus test, is the dream authentic? Well, does it conform with Scripture? Mm-hmm. That's a good, good idea, a good thought there. Um, you know, some bad guys can have dreams, like Nebuchadnezzar had mm-hmm. a dream. Uh, it was a, a dream about the future. He was totally unable to interpret it. And he came to Daniel for the interpretation thereof, which brings up the question of dreams and interpretations, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if, he, if you're not a Christian, you don't know anything about Scripture, you're not going to interpret the dream properly. You're going to have a completely different worldview and, and not understand what's going on. So you need to find someone who is accurate, who is godly, that believes in, in everything the Scripture talks about, and then talk with them to see if they have an idea. But you've got to be careful. You have to find someone that's really godly. There, there's an example of um, a prophet that was told to go preach in, in Judah, I believe it was, or Israel, one of, the, one of the two. Preach what he was supposed to preach, mm-hmm. come back, never go back there again. And he did that and it worked out fine. This other person who apparently was a true prophet from a long time ago wanted him to come to his house and he said, well, I can't do that. The Lord said, I'm never supposed to set foot over there again. And the prophet lied. He said, well, I had a dream and the Lord told me you're supposed to come here and we're supposed to fellowship. So the guy believed it, went over there and wound up getting killed. So just because someone's supposed to be a prophet or supposed to be godly doesn't mean they won't lie or misinterpret. So you have to be careful because the, the things dealing with scriptures are always very, very serious. Yeah, in a moment I want to get to uh, contemporary dreams <clears throat> and the, the possibility, the actuality of dreams uh, in, in current Christianity. But before that, let's, let's go back and talk about some more classic dreams. Uh, and you've got several listed. By the way, I'm looking at uh, Ken's book. It's called The Ancient Language of Dreams in which he goes through uh, just dozens of biblical examples of, of dreaming. and, and uh, I guess you could say the application that, that we find by studying these, these dreams. Uh, speaking of bad guys or, or people who might not be believers, uh, there's the story in the New Testament of Pontius Pilate and his wife. Mm-hmm. And Pilate's wife had a dream, and I think most of us are familiar with that. And, and, it was a, and you think of Pontius Pilate and his wife, you think of pagan Romans. Mm-hmm. You do not think of, of anybody Christian at all. True. Yeah. His wife may or may not have been Christian. A lot of people were beginning to follow the Messiah or follow his teachings and itinerary and kind of wonder about him. Now Pilate, on the other hand, was a Roman centurion. His job was to keep peace. This guy was causing problems or somebody didn't like him. So what is the easiest way to do this? And he thought, well, I'll give it to the people. The people said they want Barabbas, not mm-hmm. Jesus. And he said, well, my hands are tied. I'll go ahead and crucify this guy. What's he done, really? He just said he was God or the king or something. Didn't really do anything. Not worthy of death. But he kind of felt like he had to. His wife says, I had a dream about this guy last night. Don't have anything to do with him. Well, if I don't, there's liable to be a riot. Doesn't matter. Don't have anything to do with him. He goes ahead and sentenced Jesus to death. And of course the church fathers and the Roman records record that Caesar got really upset when he heard that there was a healer that may have been able to heal him 
And some guy, Pontius Pilate, put him to death. For what? Hmm. For standing in a corner. So he was arrested, sentenced to death, and, and it was eventually executed. So her dream actually came to pass. If you have anything to do with this guy, you will suffer for it. Don't do it. Yeah, and it's a matter of historical record that mm -hmm. his that Pilate's downfall was was swift after that. Mm -hmm. So amazing uh, the study of dreams. We all have dreams. I think we would all, uh, all of us as Christians, would love to be able to hear from the Lord, mm -hmm. the, the Spirit of God. Uh, it'd be nice if, it, in a dream, he t he told me what I'm supposed to do. That way, there would be no doubt in my mind. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But I don't get that kind of guidance, at least not yet. But God does guide people through dreams, uh, biblical uh, personages. Uh, Paul, uh, in his Corinthian mission, you have that here uh, as, uh, as an example. And, and then the, 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 the famous one in the New Testament is the dream of uh, Cornelius and the vision of Simon Peter. And, Let's spend some time on that one, <clears throat> because you're here you have both a vision and a dream in a single narrative, the relationship between uh, Peter and Cornelius. Right, and you also have one being a believer and one not being a believer. So you've got Cornelius who is a, a, a possible somewhat believer, someone curious about things, never mm -hmm. accepted the Messiah, never become a Jew, he's a Roman centurion. He's doing his job. He's eating the type of food that you're not supposed to eat for Jews, living in a way that Jews don't live. And it's customary for, according to the law of Moses, that a Jew would not enter the house of someone like that. Mm -hmm. So you just don't, don't do anything with them. And you definitely wouldn't sit down and eat with them because their food's not kosher. So those laws were meant for a reason. And what's interesting is the Lord speaks to Cornelius in a vision. And uh, basically tells him there's this guy named Peter or Simon and he lives at this address. He can tell you about what you're seeking. The guy, and he's like, okay. So he gets a couple of servants and says, go to this address, see if there's some guy there named Peter. If it is, bring him to me. Okay, while all this is going on, that's, that's the unbeliever. Peter, of course, who is a believer, he's, he's already in ministry working with uh, Jews and he goes to sleep and has a dream and that's the famous dream of the Lord lowering the the uh, sheet and there's all these different wild animals in it and it says a voice says arise kill and eat and Peter says I wouldn't do anything like that they're unclean and the voice says well what I've called clean don't call unclean arise you know and all of a sudden Peter wakes up so one's a dream one's a vision he wakes up and all of a sudden there's a knock at the door so he goes and there's this guy saying there's this guy he said he saw you in a vision or dream. Or he, are you Peter? Are you, you're supposed to come with us. Mm -hmm. So it's not too often people come to your door and ask you to come over and talk to them about the gospel. So naturally any Christian will do that. He goes over there and he gets to the point where he realizes this is a Gentile. So he doesn't dare enter the house or anything. He stands in the courtyard and preaches the gospel to him. And all of a sudden Cornelius is filled with the Spirit, begins to speak in tongues, and Peter uses that later on at the question of circumcision and those things. It's like, well, this is a guy that apparently just believed and he was good enough for the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so we shouldn't require you know, things of, of them. But apparently Christianity, the Holy Spirit, salvation is to Jews and to Gentiles, to anyone who would believe. And the discussion uh, about the degree to which uh, Christians should keep law you know, was a huge factor in the early church. Oh yeah, Acts 15. And of course the book of Galatians written by Paul and, mm -hmm. and the, the constant discussions they had about uh, what must we do in order to be pleasing to, to God. And that the transition out of that into the era of the gospel of grace required a lot of understanding. Mm -hmm. And and I'm sure that the, the apostles had this notion that if they had doubts that God would guide them mm -hmm. in dreams and visions. Of course, they were, were given uh, Scripture. Exactly. And they were given it uh, at the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so they really had a special relationship with the Holy Spirit. Which brings up a question. And, and I, I wasn't going to ask this, but I think I will. Let's go back to the Old Testament prophets. 
Um, Ezekiel comes to mind, uh, for example, uh, and Jeremiah. These men wrote about sweeping cataclysmic changes that would take place in the future. Mm -hmm. They apparently had visions, and then they wrote those things down. Uh, comment on that, if you will, because th that would come under the heading of a vision, not a dream, right? True. Yeah, and a lot of people get kind of scared because in our last 2,000 years, you've had a lot of false prophets. Mm -hmm. I can think of Joseph Smith and lots of other groups that say, well, I had this dream that God appeared to me and this is the way it's going to be and made predictions and none of it ever comes true. So a lot of people are beginning to think that maybe none of the gifts continue, this type of thing. And, and the point is that it always has to be, again, checked by Scripture. You know, when, when you have a group that says, well, the Lord's going to come back and set up uh, the kingdom in Independence, Missouri, that's not what Scripture says. And you can't just change your mind like that. God's never changed His mind. It's always been exactly the way it has, all the way through the Old Testament and the New Testament. So you have to be very careful in, in understanding that. So there was an office of a prophet, and they were specifically given dreams and or visions but also a special gift of actually writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the text. And then because of them being proved a prophet by miracles, prophecies, and other things, their text was put in the canon. So I don't think anybody should claim to have a dream or a vision, whether it's real or not, to try to put it in the canon. Well, let's talk then about, uh, and, and I'm going to turn to page 52 in your book, about Jeremiah's uh, is it a dream or a vision? His basket of figs. And, and, and figs, uh, the fig tree is the tree, the national tree you know, that represents Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I think it's pretty commonly understood that the fig, Israel's the fig tree. Mm -hmm. and, and Jeremiah had a, a uh, was it a dream or a vision in which he saw two baskets of figs? Yeah, that dream is interesting too. And, and a lot of people will look at this and say, if I did have a dream, how in the world could I figure it out? Well, in Jeremiah's time, it would have been obvious. If a fig tree represents Israel, and here's a group of figs, and you look in the basket, if the figs are good, uh, it probably Israel is doing well, which means it's being blessed of God. If the figs are rotten, something's really rotten in mm -hmm. Israel. So we could have a dream, for instance, if I had a dream similar to that, and I looked in the basket and found eagles with red, that are painted red, right, and blue, and they were sickly. I would have to assume there's something wrong with America and God's mm. getting ready to judge it. Mm -hmm. It'd be really obvious to me because of the, the, this, the colors and that. So it'd be really obvious to him too, the figs. And of course that's what it meant. God was getting ready to judge the nation and send a, in a foreign power to do that. All through the Bible, dreams, visions, uh, coming down to, the, to our modern era, Christians today, uh, there are people who believe that they have had meaningful dreams and visions. Uh, historically, a lot of modern Christians have, have related those dreams and visions, some of which have, have uh, seemed to have been borne out, but others uh, didn't work out at all. They didn't seem to be legitimate. Right. So, so what do you do in, in terms of, uh, uh, should you dream a dream, for example? And you really wonder, was this a, an authentic dream from the Lord, or was this just a figment of my imagination? What, what, what do you, uh, how do you view these things? Well, actually the church fathers talked about that and, and explained it rather well, I think. If I have a dream, and I'm not sure what it is, number one, everything should be based in around Scripture and whatever the current situation I'm dreaming of, figs, uh, eagles, whatever. So the symbolism should be very easily understood mm -hmm. if we're mature Christians. So if you know the, the New Testament very, very well, and the Old Testament fairly well at least, and you have a dream, you should be able to figure out what the meaning is. And then to check that, I would go to other people that I believe to be uh, believers that are mature, that know the Scriptures well. Mm -hmm. And like if you and I got together talking about a dream, we would both come to the conclusion, I think I know exactly what that means, and I think I know exactly who's behind it. Then it would be obvious to it. If we both said, I, I have no idea what pink the, you know, puffs are and why this would be that, it doesn't make any sense. They don't come together. 
then it's obviously just a fake dream or something Satan's trying to do to get you confused. You know, recently I have read of several incidents, for example, in Iran where they're having uh, <clears throat> a revival, but it's, a, it's a, an underground revival because mm -hmm. Christianity is outlawed in Iran. And people have seen visions that, in which the Lord told them to do a particular thing. Or they have dreamed dreams in, in which they said, Jesus is really uh, your Savior and, and you need to do such and such. And we read about those things all the time. Uh, are dreams and visions, do dreams and visions happen only where there are uh, situations where you're under duress or do they happen under all situations? I believe they can happen under all situations. I think over here we are so affluent and we are so consumed with the cares of this life that we don't bother even thinking. Why would the Lord talk to you in a dream if He knows you're going to immediately dismiss it? It's no use. You're not going to pay attention. And over there, if you take those stories as an example, uh, it wouldn't be a demonic spirit leading someone to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Mm -hmm. And just a regular dream out of your imagination wouldn't tell you to go to a certain place, there'd be Christians there, and you go there, and sure enough there are things that you couldn't have known. So those kind of things, if those are true stories, have to be something that the Lord's doing. Ken Johnson, an interesting speaker. By the way, he's going to be speaking at our Prophecy Conference in Colorado Springs, July 15th through 17th. And I'm looking at page 23 of our magazine. We'll put that on the screen for you where we're talking about uh, your uh, uh, opportunity to view this conference via live streaming vid video. I don't have time to talk about all the details, but check the website, check the magazine, and uh, follow up on that. You'll be able to see Ken's presentations live, live streaming video. And also, uh, I want to uh, offer you uh, this book, The Ancient Language of Dreams by Ken Johnson. Uh, it's got a lot more than we have time to talk about today, uh, more of the same uh, ideas, uh, interpreting the dreams and visions of Scripture. Uh, if you want to read more by Ken Johnson, he's written lots of books. And I have here the Ken Johnson collection in a, in a stack on my right here. I can't hold them all up. And here, uh, the Church Age Collection, uh, two different groups of, of Ken Johnson's studies. Uh, each one is $79.95. You can go to the online bookstore, prophecywatchers.com. Click the online bookstore, go down, uh, scroll down to the, the Ken Johnson section, and you'll find uh, the Ken Johnson Collection, the Church Age Collection, and you'll also find the Ancient Language of Dreams for $12.95. And I hope you will take advantage of that. Ken has a lot to say. Unfortunately, Ken, there's no more time to say it. <laughs> we are all out of time. Uh, I hope uh, you've stimulated a few people to study on the subject of dreams. Yeah, I hope it leads them to a closer relationship to Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and yours. And you too. And until we uh, see each other again. I'm Gary Stearman. Hey, we're watching you be watching too. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.